Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. My name is Pastor Trav. Thanks for joining us in person uh, or online. We're glad that you're here this morning and uh, excited to be together. I'd ask you this question. Have you ever had an opportunity or a time where something really, really awesome was about to happen to you, you kind of anticipated it was going to happen or knew it was going to happen, and it's right around the corner, and then it happens to you, and then it's so awesome and so great, and then your response is, nah, I'm good. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? No, some of you guys do that. Don't even lie. No, I'd rather get it myself, thanks, <laughs> you know. Like, we, sometimes we take blessings in different manners, right? But it's like that when you go out to lunch with somebody or go out to dinner, and you play this game, right? If you're taught right, you know how to play the game. So you go, to, you go to the meal, you enjoy it, and then the tab comes, the bill comes, and the waiter or waitress is like, how, you know, who's going to pay for it? And the one person's like, no, I got it. And if it's not you, then, then you're supposed to grab for your wallet. You guys know this game? I don't even have my wallet in my pocket. <laughs> so to grab your wallet and like, oh, no, no, it's okay. I can get it, you know. Like, eh. And they're like, no, no, really. I, I can get it. That, then you're like, Phew. good. All right. You're, you got it, man. You got it. Right? And you play that little game, that little dance. Um, and sometimes we call those things blessings. Um, and that, that word is, is unique. Uh, sometimes, you know, we put cute little signs and, you know, bless this mess. <laughs> you know, like, uh, and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, somebody inevitably has that sign in their house. You can email Pastor Doug. He'll handle it. Um, <laughs> he'll be fine. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we put this word in different spots, and I'm just kind of picking a little bit. Um, but, you know, God bless you is still a thing, I think. Although I read like three different articles this week that there's like oh, 10 different ways to not say God bless you when someone sneezes. I'm like, you know, you're lucky you're on the internet, and I can't, never mind. Um, <laughs> like, come here and sneeze, <laughs> you know, but uh, typically we still say God bless you sometimes, or just bless you even, as a courtesy. If you're from the South, and you hear a real thick Southern accent, and they say, bless your heart, um, <laughs> it's not nice. <laughs> they're saying, you're, you're stupid, <laughs> you know, like, that's what they're saying, but they're saying it nicer than that, you know, bless your heart. Um, so we use these, this, this word blessing in a bunch of different ways. And, and actually, Jesus uses this term to teach his people. He uses the word blessing in a passage that we call the Beatitudes. And some of you guys are like, the what? Uh, the word is Beatitudes is what it looks like. And, and, and that's the capture of this passage we're about to dig in. But essentially what that means is it's the Greek word makarios, which I don't obviously speak Greek. Um, but it's, that means an existing state of blessedness, okay? So sometimes we say, bless you, or God bless me, and we're asking, or we're anticipating, or we're hoping for. This is an existing state of blessing. So this is not something that we can earn, not something that we can get, but it's something that is already present through him, okay? So that word, makarios, is beatitudos in Latin, which obviously I don't speak that either, which gets to beatitudes in English. If you search that on Google, uh, you will find that it's mostly connected to this Bible passage. It's a pretty unique word. It's kind of cool. You don't find that in a bunch of different contexts. Um, and it's that, again, it means an existing state of blessedness. So this passage that we're going to spend a few weeks talking about the beatitudes, and you're going to hear that term quite a bit, that is simply the attitudes and characteristics of those who are like Christ and inherit his kingdom. So the Beatitudes are the attitudes and the characteristics of those who are like Christ and will inherit his kingdom. Also known as, a, you got it, you guys are clever as all get out, beautiful attitudes. Ah, see what we did there? Clever, huh? That'll help you understand and remember this a little bit. But these beautiful attitudes are what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. And I want to jump right into Matthew chapter 5. He gathers his disciples around and he saw the crowds were coming up. And verse 1 says this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Another, another version of the Bible says he opened his mouth which is a cool little way of saying that he always taught them, just this time he was going to use words. See what I'm saying? But number, verse 3, he says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've been a Christian for 34 years, six years old, uh, Lincoln City, closet bedroom. It's literally what it was, a closet that would turn into a bedroom. Uh, Gave my life to Christ with my parents, was baptized at 14, have been following the Lord ever since. I've sinned like five times since then, so um, it's a pretty good record. But um, (laughs) just kidding. But I... uh, (laughs) But I read this, I've read this passage like, I, I have no idea. I couldn't even begin to count how many times, if I was going to guess how many times I've read Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes. I've studied them. I've done all that. And I look at this passage, and I see that blessed are the poor in spirit. And it's, it's hard for me because I'm like, what does, that, what does that mean? Because when I think of poor in spirit, it probably thinks, I probably think the way you think. And I kind of think like, oh, you know, a downer or somebody that's sad or that's less than or um, something like that. So I was like, man, maybe I'm not the only one that thinks that. So this this whole week, I was asking different people, some pastors, some friends, some Christians, some non-Christians. I was just asking the question like, hey, what do you think it means to be poor in spirit? And they're like, yeah, something like Eeyore, you know, like that's, I don't know how else to like, I don't know how else to like encapsulate it, but you know, like that. And I was like, okay, that's kind of what I felt too. And some of this passage is, is and can be that. I don't want to misrepresent that. But there's a deeper meaning in this passage, and, and it helps to get context when we read Scripture to understand this. So when we study Matthew chapter 5, we're going to see that he is talking to disciples and Jews that are coming to see and listen to him talk. They're going to be familiar with certain terms and certain things. So Jesus will speak in their terms, or in this case, he'll speak on a counter term, something that's different than what the culture says, and they will understand that. And sometimes when we hear it, we can contextualize it in our own spot, and then we're like, okay, well, it's hard to understand. So we get poor in spirit mixed up a little bit. But here's who was considered rich in spirit or full or high in spirit were the Pharisees. The religious elites, if you follow the law, if you did what you're supposed to do, if you sacrifice when you're supposed to sacrifice, if you're in the temple and you're supposed to be there, those people were considered, in that terminology, high or rich in spirit. Different context now. So when God says, through Jesus' son, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, that resonates with the people that are listening to him. They say, wait a minute, poor in spirit. I thought we were just supposed to follow the law. I thought we were just supposed to do the things we're supposed to do and check off the boxes and, you know, attend church when we're supposed to and blah, blah, blah. And he says, no, 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 hold up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so when we look at poor in spirit and we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It simply means this, that we come to a deep realization that we are in need of a savior. That's it. I know, it's like, wow, let's peel back the layers and unpack it. This is what it means. It means that the religious elite then were high in spirit or rich in spirit, or they thought well of themselves because they held the law. But Jesus is saying the exact opposite. He's saying, no, 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 blessed are the guys and gals that are poor in spirit because they realize their need for a savior. That's powerful stuff when you start to think. Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So it's not just a poor me attitude. It's not just a downer attitude or an Eeyore attitude. It's an understanding that we need Jesus. So he's telling these people, he's listening, they're listening, asking him, how do we get to the kingdom of heaven? How do we follow you? How do we do this? And he's been teaching. And he simply says, you need me. Blessed are the poor in spirit who run out of themselves. And I, or Jesus, right, gets to enter in. Now he he illustrates this with a, parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke chapter 18. Like if, because the disciples were like you and I, he would tell them stuff and then they wouldn't get it. And then he'd tell them stuff again. And then he's like, well, let me, you know, let me tell you a story. (laughs) He still didn't get it. Um, You know, and then he's like, well, let me tell it plain again in another story. Right? So he's telling the disciples this parable and he's saying here, this is how this makes sense of this right here. So in Luke chapter 18, verse nine, he says to some who were confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. I don't like the way that sounds either. (laughs) Because that feels like he's talking to us. 
Time out. We're going to take a 30-second time out, not a full, okay? But in this moment, this is just a little rant. I got 30 seconds. In this moment, I want you to understand something. They're confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else. I am tired, literally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally exhausted, listening to people tell me that the righteousness, the self-righteousness of the church people are why they don't want to come to church. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of listening to people, oh, they think they're better than us. Oh, they think they haven't sinned. Oh, they think, am I running out of 30 seconds? I'm probably there. I'm going to get kicked out. (laughs) Technical, here it comes. But to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. (sighs) Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself, of course, and he went first, (laughs) fitting, and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. He's doing, he's doing better than some of us. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, that's a different message for a different time. <laughs> but Where's my drummer? But Right? But, but look at this for a second. We got this Pharisee who's, who's praised this prayer, at least I'm not like other people. The Pharisee would be the highly respected, highly sought after, the leader of the pack, the one that people are looking to, the one they're trying to follow. And here he is praying, at least I'm not like these other bums. At least I'm not like these guys that sleep in camps on the side of the road. At least I'm not like the guy who's messing up his marriage through porn. I think, that's, I think it's all encompassed in there. It says evildoers, right? At least I'm not like them. And I do all the right things. I go to church. Man. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let me give you some, some context. The tax collector is going to be despised. This is a guy that not, only, not much has changed when you work hard for money and then people take it without your permission. It's funny. <laughs> we don't tend to like it, you know? But tax collectors in their days, they would, they would manipulate things and they would change things and they would take more than they should or manipulate people in different ways. And so these people were hated. They were despised. So on one hand, you have this righteous man, quote unquote, that's praying this prayer. And on the other side, you have you and me. Who wouldn't even look up to heaven because he's so ashamed. And all he can mutter is, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And verse 14 says this, I tell you that this man, referring to the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. (sighs) Let's bow our heads in prayer, right? (laughs) Like this, when you look at this thing right here, we, we see this juxtaposition of these two people. And at times, church people, we get into that pharisaical mode where we think, well, at least I'm not like them. And I do pretty good for myself. (laughs) But really, we should be over here. I'm not saying you shouldn't lift your eyes to heaven. God's not like that. He's not waiting to beat you over the head. But we should be over here saying, God, help us. I'm a sinner. Have some mercy on me. Because blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. See, the thing that we have to understand right now before we go any further is that God created this creation. He created the animals, the birds, the light, the darkness, the earth, the water. He created you and I, and he loved what he created. That's what the Bible said. He saw that it was good, and he loved it. And he loved it so much that he wanted to spend time with it and be with it and be connected. But see, we're just, we didn't figure it out because we hadn't been humbled yet. And we sin and we do things that are wrong. 
And we bring a divide between what is right and good and just and ourselves. And there's a gap. And that gap has to be filled with something. We call this the gospel message. But the gap has to be filled because unrighteousness and righteousness can't be together. Light cannot fellowship with darkness. We have to have a way to make the two become one again, right? And so God says, I'm going to give the best that heaven has. And I'm going to send my son Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, to walk this earth, to live a life just like you and I, to be tempted, to be pushed, to be pressured, to be all of that, with, and yet live it without sin. And then we see a moment where Jesus himself demonstrates what it means to be poor in spirit. When he gets to that point in the garden where God says, hey, I'm going to have to have you lay your life down on the cross. I'm going to have to have you pay that penalty and that sacrifice for these people. And Jesus says, not my will, but yours. And then he gets up from the garden, he gets arrested, he gets beaten, he gets dragged through, he gets hung on the cross, and he pays a debt that we should have paid. See, we were separated from God. We were away from God. But yet Jesus pays that debt. And I've said this a thousand times, if I've said it once, that when I, if, if Jesus paid a debt that I owed, that would be good enough for me. But God is not a God of good enough. He's a God of more than enough. And so he didn't just pay the debt. He went to the grave. He wrestled. He took death, hell, and the grave by the keys and came back out, resurrected, all-powerful, almighty God, and said, not only do I want to have you with me to live a life and a life abundantly, but I want you to live with me eternally. That's the gospel. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. That nothing that we can do on our own, nothing that we can provide on our own or work hard enough or get good enough at, is going to suffice. You think, well, I'm a pretty good dude. I'm a pretty good person. Maybe. Not good enough. This is, the, this is what we have to do. And you already see on the side, you have to get rid of our self-sufficiency and pride. We as a people have to pray every day. James 4, 6 says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Mm. C.S. Lewis says it this way, make no mistake about it, pride is the great sin. It is the devil's most effective and destructive tool. John R.W. Stott, who was also a theologian, He says, pride is the greatest enemy, is your greatest enemy. Humility is your greatest friend. Because blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. I I looked back on there to see if it said theirs is going to be the kingdom or they're going to get there eventually, but it just says theirs is the kingdom. And I believe that when I read my Bible, it says we pray as on earth as it is in heaven. And so I want to be in that camp where I'm blessed because I'm poor in spirit and the kingdom of heaven. Proverbs 29, 23 says, pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Hey, guess what? Culture has figured this out. You've got guys like John Collins, Patrick Lencioni, John Maxwell, three, of, three guys that I've read m- multiple of their books. They're leadership guys. They're great. John, or, uh, Patrick Lencioni wrote Death by Meeting, which is probably one of the greatest books for like leadership stuff, and it's just awesome. And, and it's not necessarily biblical principles, but here's what they found in all three different realms, and you can go down a, a rabbit hole and find out the same thing. They were trying to figure out why bosses, CEOs, people that are leaders, why are they good leaders and why does their company succeed? So they do all this research to find out, and they boil it down, and they say, well, first of all, here's why you fail as a leader in the business world, because you're prideful, arrogant, you're a self-promoter. That's leaders that fail. So on the other side, they said, well, okay, if those are the guys that failed, then what what makes the guys successful? They found they boiled it down to a bunch of things, and two main things stood out. Number one was a humble leader. And I'm assuming most of us work jobs or have worked a job before, and when I said prideful, arrogant, you know, (laughs) self-promoting leaders, you thought of that boss. (laughs) Hopefully you've been in a work environment where where you've worked for a humble leader. Somebody that does not have all the answers, that does not have it all figured out. And along with humility came teamwork. Those are the two top things that companies that succeed 
and leaders that succeed and in multiple different venues, multiple different job areas and careers and fields, humble and teamwork were the ones that succeeded. Prideful, arrogant, self-promoting leaders fail. Seems like the Bible gets it right. Again. But see, we oftentimes, we listen to culture because the culture is a self-promoting culture. It's a self-sufficient culture. And, and please don't get it wrong. Don't get it twisted. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a job or you shouldn't work hard. That's literally why I'm scared for our next generation. But that's a different message, okay? That's not what I'm saying. That's, I'm not asking you to be like, well, you know, you know, sit on my butt and then God will just rain it down, you know? Israelites did that. They didn't eat real well. They stayed in the desert for 40 years. Anyway, um, that's also another sermon. But what I'm asking you, and, and what I'm telling you is that we got to get to a point where we're poor in spirit, where we understand that the things that we can do and the things that we can, that, that we can accomplish are limited. See, because I came to know, when I came to know Christ, I understood these principles, and I've grown in these principles my whole life, that God has a purpose and a plan for Travis just like he does for you. And those purposes and plans that he has for me are much better than anything that I could ever come up with myself. Same goes for you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, a direction that he wants you to go, things that he wants you to accomplish, great things that he wants you to do. And they're far better than anything that you can create on your own. And so when we become poor in spirit, we understand that all the self-promotion, all the pride, all the arrogance begins to fall off. And we understand that blessed are we that are poor in spirit. Or simply blessed are the humble. Now I know all, listen, I know none of us in here have pride or arrogant issues, okay? That is the joke. Get it? <laughs> anyway. But we, this is something that, that isn't, Touched on a lot, I think, because people get upset and, you know, you get a little, eh, eh. but it's true, man. Pride and arrogance creeps in in every part. And if we're not careful, that's going to consume us. And we're going to rely a lot more on ourselves than we are on God. So how do we keep ourselves poor in spirit? You carry around one of these. You're like, that's not in the Bible. I, <laughs> that's not in the Bible. All right? That little frog thing is not in the Bible. It's not. <laughs> All right? Full disclosure, you're not going to find it in 2 Ecclesiastes 17.45. All right? <laughs> but it's a good principle. When I used to work in youth and kids ministries, we used to use little tools to help memorize and to help remind us of things. And I ordered some of these, and I want you guys, everyone at the end of service, the ushers at the doors will have baskets full of these little tiny frogs. And I want you to take one if you want to and have it be a reminder, have it be something that locks it in for you on what we're trying to accomplish. Because the frog principle is simply this, to fully rely on God. Fully rely on God. This is hard to see. This is not. <laughs> I sleep with this every night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Joking. I don't. But what if I do? You think... Like I used to tell the teenagers, if you think you're big enough... Right? Come on up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, but sometimes we need little visual reminders and things to help us put it in your pocket, carry it around, just as a simple reminder. Just as an easy reminder. Because too often we get away from the frog principle and we get on the me principle. Too often we're off on our own thing and we're forgetting that God who is our sustainer, who is our provider, who wants to work, who wants to will, who wants to do the things that he has purposed for you in your life. And remember, I told you, they're far greater than the things that you could even think or imagine. That's what the Bible says, that we have to fully rely on God to be able to do it. So some of you guys need to put a big old fat frog in your mirror every morning and remember that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little one. <laughs> what you do with that is on you now. So how do we fully rely on God? This is, this is the meat and the potatoes, right? We have to pray. We have to pray. We have to wake up every day and throughout the day. The Bible says to pray continually without ceasing. 
I pray prayers all the time that says, God, less of me is what John the Baptist prayed, but less of me and more of you. Let I decrease so that you can increase. That's an anti-pride prayer, right? That's a, hey, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about you, God. I pray things like, thank you for, and in the first service, I'll tell them myself, I said, I was going to say food in our stomachs and clothes on our backs, but I said food on our backs. <laughs> it got weird. <laughs> right? I won't say that this time. But I thank God. I wake up and say, God, help me to remember that it's you who put the food in my stomach and the clothes on my back. God, help me to remember that the house that I live in, you provided for me. God, help me to remember that the joy that, that I experience, even if it's momentary or light or anything, it's you who provided that for me. See, Jesus, in his mission, it says that he said, not my will, but yours. And the author of scripture later says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That Jesus understood the principle I'm going to fully rely on God. i got to fully rely on the Father to get through this thing. Read your Bible. Some of you guys pull out, pull out the Bible. A lot of times they have nice covers on them. Yours has a real thick dust layer. You can wipe it off or blow it off. And you're <laughs> it's a joke. Calm down. Email Pastor Doug. <laughs> right? But read, read your Bible. In all seriousness, read your Bible. If you're having a hard time saying, God, why, don't, why aren't you blessing me? Why, why aren't I getting to do these things? Why, why can I not figure out how to fully rely on God? Read your Bible. Let him speak to you in that. Seek wise counsel. That's something that we don't often think about or do. We always say pray and, re pray and read your Bible, but we don't often say seek wise counsel. When you're praying and you're reading your Bible and God imparts to you something or moves in your spirit some way and says, yeah, you should do this or whatever, seek wise counsel on that. Ask God to confirm that through somebody that you trust and you believe that is wise and that's God-following and God-fearing. And surrender our will. That's the hardest thing to do. <laughs> it's tough. But I hope that when you see a frog, you'll just smile and think, yeah, I gotta fully rely on God. <laughs> right, because too often we rely on ourselves and we forget to rely on God. And Jesus says pretty clearly, blessed are those who are poor in spirit for the kingdom is theirs, or blessed are those that are humble. I want to share this paraphrase with you as the worship team comes and we close. Blessed are those who humbly recognize their need for God, for they will enter into his kingdom. Man, if you're not at a point today where you're like, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I haven't fully relied on God. Maybe I have some pride issues. Maybe I'm trying to figure this thing out and I haven't figured out how to do all that. Here's what I ask you to do. Don't wait to start that journey. Don't think, well, I'll get around to it tomorrow. Don't think, well, when I wake up Monday, I'll start a diet and I'll start doing this. Just do it now. Do it now. Get right with God right now. Remember, the tax collector is the one that said, God, have mercy on me. The Pharisee, the one that had everything together. I'm asking you to cry out to God as a tax collector and say, God, have mercy on me because I'm a sinner. That's a prayer that keeps me low in spirit, poor in spirit, that I'm a sinner. I can't do this, God, but you can. And I want to rely on you. We're going to sing a song that's my favorite worship song, literally, of all time. And it's a simple song, and I'm going to have her put the words on the screen. Um, but it, it just illustrates what we're talking about so well. Because oftentimes we want to, you know, we want our thing. We've, we've hammered that. We want to do what we want to do. But this song is all about what God wants and how do we follow that. The verse says, this is my desire to honor you. And Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me. I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. So here's the chorus part. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. I don't know if you'll think of a frog now during worship, but oh well. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. God, let us fully rely on you. Heavenly Father, God, we're like the tax collector who can barely lift our head because we understand that in our own self, in our own spirit, and the things that we can accomplish and control, God, are so little. But thank you for being a God of more than enough. Lord, we're told all the time, just be yourself. You'll be enough. You could blah, blah, blah. But God, we know that that's not true. And I thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to prove 
to us and to be that sacrifice for us that with you and your purposes and your will, we are more than enough. We are more than conquerors in you. So God, I pray that you, whether, whether we've given our life to Christ 40 years ago, God, or today is the first time in which we'll make that step, God, I pray that you would come in and to humble us, Lord God, that we would recognize our need for you in our life and that we would follow you in every step of the way, fully rely on you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna invite you to stand if you're able, and we're gonna sing this chorus together. before we close.